Let me start by telling you something about episode five, The Coffin of AMC's Preacher. This was the episode that I was waiting for. This is that Preacher vibe that everything I felt has been building up to. It's just insane with the amount of things that are going on from all the different directions. We've got Grandma Langell and her clan. We've got Hairstar and his clan. We've got All Father Humperdu and, and, and over there. We've got the saint who ha can't even use his guns and has to go and find Arseface and Hitler. We've got the devil in play. We've got Dog, who's, I think, going through a live my life crisis, yet somehow still wants to keep poking at Tulip and Jesse. All of this stuff was going on in this episode, and I thought it was fantastic. I, I thought, again, if we look back at the season, I mean, the first season, I think, was really pretty much a prequel, if you can say that. And the first season uh, really set things up. Second season got things going, but I thought it was a little stretched out. I feel like 10 episodes is perfect because things are just, it's just pedaled to the metal going on. Really great, strong episode. I'm not even going to make bones about it, but I will say at the end, there is one head-scratching thing I will have to admit to. I will say that. But the fight scene between Jesse, Tulip, uh, Jody, and TC with Warren Zevon's Werewolves of London playing, there's just something about the musical selections in this series that are done for the fight scenes that are just fantastic. I just thought that across the board, all four of them deserved a ton of credit. The hair star scenes with Humberdew, hysterical, and it's amazing because it really plays into not only just how good of an actor Pip Torrin is, but it really plays into this idea that Jesse and hair star in the series are really two sides of the same coin, much more so in the comic book, and I like that because I have a feeling by the time this season's over, they're really going to be forced into much more cooperation than maybe either one of them is going to be comfortable with. Uh, third thing I want to point out is Cassidy, Joseph Gilgan. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen the piece from San Diego Comic-Con that I posted, please check it out. That's a cheap plug. But I want to say that so far, this really has been his season, and I haven't given him enough credit because it's really been tied up to the, you know Betty Buckley and Jeremy Childs and Colin Cunningham and Dominic Cooper and Ruth Nega. But Joseph Gilgan, I think, has just been nailing it episode after episode after episode and giving Cassidy just a complexity and a diversity that we just really don't expect. We haven't gotten up to this point, and and I think it it, it pays dividends. I, I'm I was concerned that sending him away from the action would make me not want to care about his storyline, but just the opposite. I actually care about his story storyline a lot, and I'm very curious to see where things go with Icarus and the interview with a vampire looking um a vampire group that he's found himself in uh one of the previews uh coming up uh involving bees and wicker man and hoover i think is particularly funny um comic book fans i'm just gonna tell you right now if, if you're watching this and you're a fan of the comic books then you must be loving this right now we got the f communism lighter we've got the john wayne reference that are being brought into play we're getting so many more of the comic book references and and it's it's funny because you saw on the twitter account or on the preacher's twitter account they even say you know this one is for the comic book fans but it fits and it works. I don't know if I necessarily would have wanted to see the John Wayne type character throughout the season, but I do like that it happened in this moment in the coffin. Now, is the co did the coffin remind me a lot of Uma Thurman? Yes, it did. Uh, I was just completely thinking about that the entire time, but that's high compliment. But I like the fact that this episode really started giving us a sense of Jesse getting his mojo back. And Tulip, well, she just never lost it. Tulip is just progressively badass. Now, I will say, there is one thing I've got to call the episode out for. It's the fact that everybody was surprised, and again, spoiler warning, that everybody was surprised that if Grandma died, Tulip was going to die. I, I mean, again, it's... I mean, I wasn't surprised as a viewer because of a lot of things we saw, but even from their standpoint, knowing Grandma at this point, really, would they not have figured that she wouldn't have some kind of escape clause? That really, really surprised me. So I, I do take one point away from that, from the common sense, but again, I, all is forgiven because the pace of this show is just in incredible. And from what we see of what's going to be coming on for the rest of the semester, it doesn't look like it's going to be lightening up. We're going to be seeing the Grail, and we're going to be seeing the Langelles working together to get Grandma some souls. And Grandma, showing obviously her appreciation, starts bartering with a deal with the devil. I think to hand Jesse and Genesis over, and we know that's not going to go pleasant. But again, the energy, the passion, the acting, the action, the vibe of everything this episode was exactly what I was looking for as we're heading into the midpoint of the season. Big, big thumbs up for the episode. Looking forward to seeing what's going to be coming up with episode six. Um, but again, really, really strong turnout. I think it's a really, really good note in which to, for the series to continue on for the rest of season three. And hell, we're only, as Sam Caitlin said, only at the halfway point. So only imagine what's still to come.